Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone that is joining us for this uh, very important discussion on strengthening the role of the European Union in global health. When we first thought of organizing this session, we did not think that uh, the European Union would be so challenged also to act in global health in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, the whole issue of global health has, of course, become much, much more prominent on uh, the European Union agenda. We're very lucky today to have the representatives here of what is called the TRIO presidency. Uh, for those of you that are not that familiar with the European Union, it means that the uh, present presidency, which is Germany, and the two upcoming presidencies, which is Portugal and Slovenia, work together to ensure more continuity on a whole number of issues. And in this case, they have decided to also do that in global health. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the panel that is here with us. We have Dr. Marta Temido, who is the Minister of Health of Portugal. Welcome very much to this panel. We have uh, Dr. Vesna Kerstin Petric, who is the Acting Director of the Public Health Directorate in Slovenia. Lovely to see you, Vesna. Hello. And we have the State Secretary here from Germany from the Federal Office, uh, from the uh, Federal Ministry of, uh, of Health, uh, Sabine Weiss, who is with us. And because so much of the activities that the EU has recently launched in global health are so closely connected to the World Health Organization, we have also invited Dr. Bernhard Schwartländer, the Chef de Cabinet from the WHO Geneva, to also provide input to our discussions. So without further ado, I'm going to go to our panelists and uh, first ask uh, State Secretary Weiss to give us some understanding of you know, why the TRIO presidencies wanted to work together on global health and uh, what kind of issues are being taken up and taken forward. Please, uh, State Secretary, floor is yours. Please unmute yourself always. <laughs> okay, yes. better now? Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Kikbush. Dear Minister Timido, dear Mrs. Petrich, dear Mr. Schwartländer, dear colleagues and friends. For many years, the World Health Summit has been an important forum for everyone who is interested in global health. This year's World Health Summit is special. I think it is fair to say that no one needs to be convinced of the importance of global health anymore. Therefore, I very much regret that we are not able to meet in person today. Therefore, also, I'm convinced that, it's, that this important session on the EU's role in global health is very relevant for policy markets, ma market makers and actors in global health. Already in 2019, a multi EU presidency initiative concerning the role in global health was officially launched. During the past few years, global health has already been an important issue on the political agenda, both in Europe and globally. But the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly put it under an even brighter spotlight. The pandemic has also shown that many expect the EU to continue its leadership role in global health overall and in particular in the forum of the WHO. For us at the current TRIO presidency, it is crucial to reinforce the role of the EU in global health. This can be achieved employing a consistent, coordinated and strategic approach. For this, the initiative on the strengthening of the EU role in global health 
is necessary. It guarantees coherent and lasting ambitions on the role of the EU in global health throughout changing EU presidencies. The plan of the initiative is to develop recommendations that can be presented at the end of the Slovenian EU presidency in 2021. To continue work, Germany will host the next meeting of the working group on Go Global Health this Wednesday. Undoubtedly, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that health challenges do not stop at borders. Therefore, we need strong international coordination and cooperation. The WHO plays an important role in addressing cross-border health threats. Consequently, we need a strong WHO as the leading and coordinating authority in global health. However, the pandemic has shown that the expectations of the, of the WHO member states do not align with the de facto capabilities of the organization. It has become clear that we need to strengthen the WHO. And when it comes to this process, we need to make sure that the EU continues to take a leading role. Germany, together with France, has launched a reform initiative to strengthen WHO earlier this year. Inspired by this, we proposed concrete measures for discussion in an informal meeting with all EU health ministers held on October 2 this year in the framework of Germany's EU presidency. Member States agreed that the EU needs to be the driving force with regards to reinforce the WHO. In our opinion, the EU should not only react to the proposals of others, but should proactively shape the agenda with constructive proposals. A Council conclusion text on the strengthening of the WHO and the EU's role in this process has been discussed in Council and it is supposed to be tabled for polit political agreement in a special EBSCO next Friday. For Germany, global health has been a topic of highest importance for a long time. Earlier this month, the German federal government has published its new global health strategy. Under the slogan, Responsibility, Innovation, Partnership, Shaping Global Health Together, the German government lines out its political commitment to global health and to the achievement of the SDGs until 2030. This includes a strong support for WHO, the key actor in global health. But this also includes that we want to, that we want to further strengthen the role of the EU in global health. One thing is clear, we will overcome this pandemic, but it will most likely not be the last one. A strong, independent and effective WHO is essential to achieve the highest possible health standards worldwide and to reduce the threat of pandemic outbreaks in the future. To make multilateralism for health stronger, we need to seize the window of opportunity. This is an important strategic, strategic goal of the trio presidencies. And I'm therefore very happy to participate in today's discussion with my colleagues from our trio presidency partners from Slovenia and Portugal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, State Secretary. And maybe for the audience, I should say that uh, the German Minister of Health could not be with us because uh, he has contracted this little virus uh, that is everywhere. He is doing well, so uh, you can rest assured. 
but still, State Secretary, we'd ask you to pass on our regards and our best wishes for his uh, recovery. And, Thank you. Uh, that would be very kind of you. So uh, many of you might perhaps have also attended the opening session last night. We have now heard uh, from the country that presently has the presidency. Yesterday, uh, we had uh, a, a speech by Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, that also gave a strong focus on global health, on the responsibilities of the European Union and its member states, and also gave an indication of some of the plans. And uh, one uh, key plan will fall in one of the upcoming presidencies, since we haven't heard dates yet, at least I haven't. Uh, about a big global health conference uh, that is also planned to keep uh, global health and the EU responsibilities on the agenda. So the state secretary said, you know, proactively uh, move forward. There are already some indications. I'm very pleased uh, to now ask uh, Dr. Temido, the Minister of Health of Portugal, to share with us uh, some of the prospects of uh, the Portuguese presidency. Portugal, of course, is a global country per se, historically, with so many links around the world. And global health, of course, is an issue that comes naturally, I would say, uh, to uh, the uh, Portuguese mindset. Would you share some of your ideas, plans, and hopes uh, with us, Dr. Temido? Good morning again, dear Professor Tikbush, dear colleagues, distinguished guests to the World Health Summit 2020. First of all, allow me to thank you for your kind invitation. Uh, and uh, let me share uh, with pleasure uh, some of the issues pointed out. Uh, the EU and the, the EU member states are strong players in the global health arena. The EU treaties place health as a fundamental human right and state that the high level of health protection shall be ensured in the definition and implementation of all union policies and activities. In this spirit, both through bilateral and multilateral cooperation, the EU and the EU member states have been contributing to the promotion of better health standards within the EU region and around the globe. Their role as key agents for change has been largely acknowledged, as well as their commitment to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the Achievement Goals pursued by the Universal Healthcare 2030 Initiative. Since the publication in 2010 of the European Commission paper, the EU role in global health, the EU has openly committed to playing a more active role on global health. The EU is recognized as a powerful actor, both financially and politically, across relevant international fora. We believe the following actions would reinforce the role of the EU as a relevant actor on, global, on, a, on the global stage. First, striving to achieve relevant internal and external health policy making. Second, amplifying the role played by the EU and the member states in global health diplomacy. Regarding Portugal, and its engagement with global health and global health diplomacy, particularly with Global South, we think that Portugal is, uh, we, we would like to stress that Portugal is a founding member of the CP, CPLP, the Community of Portuguese Speaking Countries. As the only uh, EU, EU member state of that organization, Portugal, we think, is in a unique privileged position and thus as a greater responsibility as a discussion partner with the Global South. Health is a priority for those countries of CPLP as is reflected in the legal instrument 
at its disposal, which allow it to have a larger and more coherent intervention in matters related to health, particularly through the strategic plan for cooperation in health. This plan represents a collective commitment for horizontal and structural cooperation among the member states of the CPLP in the health sector. It is an innovative, comprehensive, and integrative mechanism of synergies, which operates across the various prongs of the health sector in the CPLP. Under this program, this plan, the CPLP has created relevant structural cooperation networks within the health sector, such as the Network for National Public Health Institutes, which, which fosters the exchange of knowledge between experts and encourages further proximity to civil society. Moreover, it combines the development of science and technology in fields relating to health with structural work to support the existing national health systems within the CPLP. Portugal has been a member of the M8 Alliance since 2015. As a member of the M8 Alliance, Portugal has been participating in strategic debates regarding global health and contributing specific and diverse fields. It reinforces our commitment in the joint quest for sustainable solutions that will collectively enable us to achieve the SDG3, to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages at the end uh, the 2030 agenda. The regional meeting in Coimbra counted with a strong represented representation and engagement from countries integrated in the CPLP, with which Portugal nurtures historical and close bounds as well as solid track record of cooperation and collaboration regarding health issues. After the regional summit, Efforts have been made to leverage sustainable partnerships with Portuguese speaking African countries. In that sense, a Women's Health Forum was held and a Portuguese chapter of Women in Global Health has launched, with the aim of creating a Lusophone network of women leaders in global health, as well as a network of experts in women's health. Regarding uh, priorities that Portugal foresees, in order to promote global health objectives, the Portuguese presidency will guide its intervention by an intersectoral cross-cutting approach with view to maximizing health gains. In doing so, it will strive to adapt national health systems to the challenges regarding, the, regarding health and the environment, namely vector-borne diseases, it will underline the influence of global health on the global health security agenda and, and on the One Health approach, namely by covering the area of antimicrobial resistance. Regarding health promotion and disease prevention, the Portuguese presidency will pay special attention to the enactment of instruments aimed at promoting mental health, health literacy, and a healthier lifestyle. It is important to bear in mind that the context has changed due to the exceptional circumstances in which we all are operating today. In the coming months, the primary global health priority will remain the need to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and to strive to get it under control. The Portuguese presidency, as part of the trio is committed to contributing to reinforcing the role of the EU in improving global health, as well as leveraging the creation of strategic partnerships in the field of health, leading to the creation of an investment in robust and fruitful EU-Africa diplomatic alliances. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Minister, and thank you for uh, addressing the uh, range of issues that uh, you have planned to take up and let us hope it's possible, depending on uh, the COVID-19 uh, developments that we are all experiencing, at least 
uh, here in, in Europe. Thank you also. I'm sure the World Health Summit colleagues are very happy that you mentioned the regional summit in Coimbra, which was really absolutely extraordinary. And of course, we were lucky there to have an opening speech by uh, Secretary General Guterres and also last evening, uh, Secretary Guterres again drew our attention to the need to implement the sustainable development goals and take them forward. And I'm going to leave my uh, balanced uh, moderator role on one side for a minute and say how fantastic it is that you have taken up the women in global health agenda and will hopefully also push that uh, during your presidency. Now I'm going back. Uh, so uh, we've heard uh, about uh, these, this outreach also to the Global South, which I believe is absolutely critical. The interface, particularly European Union and Africa, but the minister also drew attention to the importance of the links with Latin America, for example. And uh, I was able to have discussions with colleagues from Fiocruz in Brazil uh, last week, and uh, they highlighted again the role of health diplomacy that you, Minister, uh, also highlighted. So we might be coming back to some of these issues. I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Petrich, who I usually call Vesna, uh, to uh, contribute uh, to the discussion. Slovenia has been very, very active uh, always within the World Health Organization uh, around uh, the uh, global alcohol agenda, for example. It's been incredibly active also at the regional level of WHO, and that's something uh, we should perhaps also reflect in our discussion you know, the contribution to the global WHO overall, uh, but also the specificity of the work between the European Union and the regional office of WHO, which has uh, great importance. And of course, also includes many more countries to the east of our region that are absolutely critical in terms of, uh, of global health and involvement. Vesna, please, the floor is yours to give us some ideas, even though, you know, by the time your presidency comes, uh, who knows where we are, but one has to plan. Please go ahead. So right, you are Ilona. Thank you for your kind words. And uh, in discussion, we will probably go deeper into what could be done with WHO. But let me now greet First Minister Marta Temida and uh, Sabine Weiss, State Secretary, uh, and of course, all the other people that are attending this important meeting. I would first of all like to apologize my minister because he was not able to attend the meeting. We are in the middle of the second wave crisis. He was uh, ill, not with the COVID, unfortunately, but he, had to, uh, he, uh, he has to come on the agenda really fast. And there are many meetings waiting for him so he wouldn't... Uh, he was not able to come here to be with us. But nevertheless, he asked me to share his thoughts uh, and we were discussing this with you um, and I will do so. So it, uh, in its efforts to guarantee the right to health for all, Slovenia takes as its starting point internationally adopted declarations and conventions in the field of human rights. Namely, each individual holds an inherent right to the best feasible standard of health. The COVID crisis has brought a sharp realization of the importance of solidarity and cooperation between the countries and within multilateral organizations such as the World Health Organization. In times like this, it is important to maintain solidarity with developing countries which the pandemic has thrust into even deeper crisis than the developed countries. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed the vulnerability of health systems and the urgent need to invest uh, in their sustainability and uh, resilience. 
in order to build health systems that are more sustainable and resilient, we need to create opportunities for developing innovations that will contribute to strengthening of our health systems and will improve their response to challenges, such as not only pandemic, but also aging, digitalization, and false and misleading health information. Slovenia will, during its presidency to EU in 2021, this is the second part of 2021, encourage discussions on how um, and uh, on how we could better and more strategically uh, approach innovation, but also address challenges relating to availability, accessibility, and affordability of pharmaceuticals. We consider this also as an important topic in connection with the realization of the 2030 Agenda Sustainability Sustainable Development Goals. Solidarity, respect for human dignity and political will are necessary conditions for the achievement of progress at the global level as regards access to healthcare services. At the same time, it is necessary to take into account the delicate issue of cultural specifics that can lead to inequality or even encroach on the integrity of human dignity. And here I'm speaking, uh, for example, of female genital mutilations and uh, similar things. The COVID-19 crisis has shown that even uh, the values can be put to a severe challenge uh, and these are the values uh, that um, uh, we are uh, that are the base of our economic integration. It has forced us to confront the truth that we must safeguard solidarity and cooperation as the most important legacy of the nations that together make up the European Union. In order to strengthen the role of the EU as a global actor, we need internal dialogue and constant discussions to achieve consensus since only in this way we will and the EU will speak with a single language and a single message. It is important that in this context we strengthen and empower our health diplomacy and uh, I hope uh, Ilona here we count on you uh, as, uh, as a support, uh, as a professional support to all of us. Slovenia sees the WHO as a key institution for addressing global health uh, issues. In order to strengthen the role of the EU in the activities of the WHO, we must also strengthen our internal coordination mechanisms. Through such cooperation, we will be able to build con uh, connections with countries outside the EU with which we share similar values and beliefs. EU as an important global economic power should also take um, action through the effective channeling of financial aid. Health is a horizontal good, a factor that brings together various stakeholders and it is uh, important uh, to be affirmed through the principle of health in all policies. The EU can act globally by education programs also and the dissemination of good practices where it has the opportunity of involving all stakeholders active in countries with poorer access to health. Slovenia has provided a, a total of 1.16 million euros to developing countries for the battle against COVID-19 in the form of material aid, contributions from international organizations and the reprogramming of development and humanitarian projects. Since 2002, Slovenia has been a partner country of the Southeastern European Health Network and an excellent example of successful regional cooperation and the strengthening of national health systems for the good of citizens of the countries concerned. Southeastern European Health Network has grown into, into an international organization that is due to celebrate its 20th anniversary next year. Slovenia will endeavor to include cooperation with the network in the activities of the program of its presidency of the Council of the EU, along with the activities that the Southeastern European Health Network is planning for its jubilee year. Slovenia is also supporting the Central European Initiative as part of the CEIWHO task, 
task force that was set up this spring in response to the coronavirus virus pandemic. This cooperation could also be used to promote EU values in the health field. Slovenia believes that the EU has already achieved a great deal in all the areas mentioned. Nevertheless, a number of serious challenges still await us. We need a strategic approach and even stronger commitments, as well as a long-term vision of how to gradually achieve the goals we have committed to. We are awarded ensuring equal rights to health and an equal level of services at the global level is a long-term process and requ requires a lot of work. For this reason, the EU must be unwavering and must hold together. Here I will end and uh, I will thank you for your attention and I hope we'll have some discussion. Thank you very much, Vesna. And uh, I think that last sentence, of course, is a very important one, must be unwavering and uh, stand together. And, uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen yesterday in her presentation also tried to bring these two elements together, the solidarity between the European countries, and you will remember uh, she also spoke of a European health union, and we will have to, you know, fill that with uh, content as well, what that means, but how that European health union that's standing together acts in solidarity and in support of uh, the rest of the world. And, uh, and that balance, I think, will be a very, very important one also for global health. And as one tries to take forward, for example, vaccines as a global good uh, and uh, issues of that, uh, that nature. And of course, not only in WHO itself, if we think of uh, the discussions right now at the World Trade Organization uh, with uh, India and South Africa, uh, wanting to be assured that uh, the access to therapeutics for COVID-19, for diagnostics and vaccines are accessible to all, also through WTO rules, is another very important role. And of course, the EU plays a major health in all policies. Uh, role in that context. I'm going to turn to Bernard Schwartlender now uh, from the WHO. You've heard a lot about um, how the EU wants to be more proactive in uh, global health in general, uh, how it wants to support the reform of WHO. And of course, much of this is happening as we speak. We've just had a special session of the WHO Executive Board where many of these things were discussed. From the perspective of uh, the uh, WHO Geneva headquarters, Bernhard, uh, how do you see this uh, extraordinary development that the EU has, and I think one must say that, suddenly uh, become uh, so active? And where can it particularly help the World Health Organization in its present challenges? Please, the word is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ilona, um, you know, esteemed ministers, uh, colleagues and friends. Um, it's indeed uh, very inspiring to hear in you know, all of the presentations today and be with you for the World Health Summit in 2020. And I'm particularly uh, inspired, you know, talking with the ministers and colleagues representing the presidency trio um, that runs until the end of 2021 um, to elaborate in such depth the nuance of their vision for the EU's engagement and in focus on global health. In fact, the first trio that was established with the very same countries, Germany, Portugal, and Slovenia, acted together starting in January 20, uh, 2007. So I'm very happy to be back with the same inspired leadership 13 years later. Uh, in many ways, uh, you know, it is in the EU's DNA from its very beginning, the EU has recognized the transborder nature of issues that have a determinative effect on the health of people within the EU and beyond. And I will come back to that. Whether it be health promotion, infectious diseases, health security, the threat of antimicrobial resistance, or the social determinants that underlie improved health outcomes, the EU has historically invested its focus in financing health areas that have, been, that have the potential to not only make the greatest impact on people's lives, 
but have the potential to affect the most uh, vulnerable people around the world. Uh, it is in this sense that global citizenship that has led the EU to funnel billions of euros into ODA in health, a couple of billions more for key multilateral organizations working in health, including the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and vaccine alliance, um, and of course, uh, programs like the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. And these resources have made a huge difference, as we all know, that can be counted in people's lives. Um, these, as I mentioned, these investments have been a lifeline for the world's most vulnerable, but also have carried with an understanding that the world is interconnected and the same type of coordination needed for health threats to EU citizens is fundamentally similar in nature to what is required for the global community. The financial support I've outlined therefore is a reflection of a larger political calculation one that puts health at the, center, at the center of foreign policy and trade and economics, and ultimately the social fabric of society. And I would like to pay tribute here shortly or briefly uh, to Chancellor Merkel, um, who was actually the chair of the first trio and who made a very you know, important statement um, when she invited, uh, when she put health on the top of the agenda of the G20 uh, press uh, you know, G20 meeting in 2015, and I would like to quote what she said. I try to be short, but I found that quote so important. The German G7 presidency has also made health a priority issue, which we'll address throughout our presidency. Why are we doing this? Firstly, because the human because the human right to health can only be enforced if a sustainable health system is in place or is put in place in every country on earth. And secondly, because globalization is tangibly making us all more dependent on one another so that increasingly the health of one person is also the health of others. In other words, the effectiveness of the health system in one country impacts on the health of other countries and on security and stability. The responsibility of individual countries and global shared responsibility are two sides of the same coin. I couldn't have said this any better, and I think in many ways it sets the stage uh, of the many of the discussions that we have today. Today, more than ever, with the COVID pandemic raging uh, throughout the world, and especially uh, back with the second or third wave even uh, also at the center of Europe, and in Berlin, and this is the reason why we cannot be together in person and have to join uh, in this online forum. Uh, but it's not only the billions of money that I've, I've mentioned. It is also really the political support, and, and thank you, um, Ilona, for mentioning this. It was the EU that sponsored a landmark resolution in May uh, this year, earlier this year, when we had uh, our first virtual um, World Health Assembly, and it happened, I want to recall that it happened in a very, very difficult situation when, we, when the world fully realized the impact of what may be coming with COVID. When the world in many ways fell apart, it was a world in disorder with countries struggling, and it was the political foresight and the political will of the EU to lead all countries with a record number of sponsors to uh, pass uh, the resolution on COVID, with many heads of states, heads of governments joining and expressing uh, their support, their solidarity with each other, and of course, uh, the solidarity to the World Health Organization. And I will come back to that later. It was a possibly, and I would like to postulate, the most important World Health Assembly in history, certainly in the recent history of the World Health Organization. And uh, the, the resolution is a landmark resolution that should set the stage of creating a better world, a safer world for everybody, no matter where they live. Uh, it was also the EU that partnered with the World Health Organization in launching um, the so-called ACT Accelerator, which is the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator in April this year an idea that we pushed forward, but it was Ursula von der Leyen, um, the president of the commission, who really partnered with the World Health Organization together with other leaders uh, to launch this ACT Accelerator to make sure that 
uh, initial resources are available and to make sure that we are much better set up and working much closer together across all of the major organizations uh, to develop and deliver the tools that are necessary, vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics to everybody in the world. Um, let, me, let me go back to my last part, uh, and I want to be brief because I think we want to take this forward in the discussions. We see, of course, the US an incredibly important partner in multilateralism. It is multilateralism that will keep the world safe, and I think that will be uh, a point for discussion later on. The EU is the largest economy in the world. The EU is the world's largest trading bloc, and the EU is the world's largest trader of manufacturers, goods, and services. The EU ranks first both in inbound and outbound international investments, and the EU is a top trading partner for 80 countries, which is, of course, you know, it shows the role that the EU has in all aspects of globalization. It is this reason why we hope that the EU will continue to be a main driver and a partner also in the work that we are putting forward in keeping the world safer. And we would like to highlight you know, one point, um, that it is not just the money and the resources that we give to countries as part of the traditional ODA. It is the intrinsic understanding that all of the economic stimulus packages, for example, all of you know, what, what puts the world together, what keeps trade going, what allows people to travel, is what will, put, what will make the world safer. We'll make it, you know, we have to do this together. And this is where the EU can, has played a huge role, but can play a very, very important critical goal into the future. And this is where we're looking to working with you very closely. Let me finish by a statement. The World Health Organization is an organization of its member states. It's an organization of all the member states in the world who come together to make sure that every human being in the world is healthy and is safe. The World Health Organization can only be as strong as the member state as an organization, as strong as the member states want it to be and give it the resources and the authorities to act together with them and on their behalf. This is where we really appreciate the, you know, the transformative initiatives that Germany has taken as the lead of the EU presidency recently, together with other member states, together with the trio, um, to find ways of how the World Health Organization can be further transformed and advanced in this transformation to become the organization that we all truly need and want, an organization that will help to keep everybody safe and keep everybody societies thriving. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bernhard. And uh, I'd just like to highlight one or two things we, we heard also from the re recent speakers. I think it's uh, important both you and Vesna and, and others, of course, also refer to the values of uh, the European Union sometimes a difficult issue uh, of debate also within the European Union and again I think here uh, partly of women's rights and uh, what is happening in some member states uh, right now uh, but you know there is a basic issue of such a large powerful bloc and uh, the values that it stands for and related to that you indirectly Bernhard referred to what uh, the president of the European Union has called, you know, the geopolitical role and responsibility of, uh, of the European Union. And that expresses, you know, that geopolitics is on the one hand, of course, financial, but uh, on the other hand, it is also about values and it is about the values one brings to a multilateral approach to keep the world safe and create common goods. And I think therefore, you know, there's all the more pressure, that's what I'm trying to come to, uh, for this uh, working group uh, that uh, uh, the TRIO has uh, established and that will of course move on uh, to also have that broader view, both uh, also Slovenia and Portugal referred to helping all policies, to one health issues, to much broader challenges than just focusing on uh, 
the health part of the European Union itself. And of course, also a European health union would probably also stand for that broader understanding of health, uh, I would think. So let's dig a little bit deeper into the expectations also of the three countries in relation to this working group, uh, in relation to the outcomes of uh, the initiative. And since Germany has the presidency, I would ask State Secretary Weiss to perhaps share some ideas with us what these outcomes could be. Please, Secretary. Please unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Now it's now. better? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Now we can. The multi-EU presidency initiative was launched in 2019, first discussed under the, uh, the Romanian EU, EU presidency and then officially launched under the Finnish EU presidency to bring together the successive presidencies, including Croatia, Germany, Portugal, Slovenia and France. An informal expert group on the EU's role in global health was established. The main reason for setting up this initiative was EU's role in global health had not attracted enough interest over the last decade. It felt that in global health, the EU could do more given its resources, but also its geopolitical ambitions. The COVID-19 pandemic has emphasized this need and it has brought global health to the center of attention also in the EU. The goal of the initiative is to develop a set of concrete recommendations for how the EU's role in global health can be strengthened and be more strategic. The expert group will present a set of recommendations during the Slovenian presidency on where and how the EU could increase its role as a leading player in the global health area. Following the Slovenian EU Council presidency, France will take over and could build upon the work of our initiative in the first half of 2022. One question that will certainly be addressed is, to what extent does the EU need to be proactive and increase its involvement in global health issues in terms of political support, financial investment or otherwise? Thank you. Thank you very much, State Secretary Weiss. And actually, I'd like to take that last question and uh, ask uh, Minister Temido to perhaps uh, give some comment on that. You know, where do you think this, uh, this proactive uh, approach of the European Union should be applied? You already gave some hints in your presentation. But where would you think from uh, the Portuguese presidency, you would really, if we go in depth, like to be uh, more proactive and, uh, and take things forward? Well, thank you so much. Of course, that we think that we need to be more proactive. Uh, as a matter of fact, the expectations that uh, we have from the initiative Salcan are very high. Uh, the changes to the global health landscape, as was stressed before, and to the geopolitical landscape over the last decade, requ required to the EU to re-examine its position and its role in pursuing global health objectives. Uh, I would like to, to stress that, uh, as uh, U, uh, WHO um, stressed, those uh, global health objectives are uh, universal health coverage, health emergencies, and better health and well-being for all. The financial and political significance of the EU and its member states is not always adequately reflected in international settings addressing global health issues. 
the EU and member states are already perceived, perceived as strong players, but they still have the potential to take on a more proactive and leading role in the international fora. The EU's shared values, including the respect for human rights, the European social model and the support for multilateralism could be more effectively reflect, reflected in decisions taken at a global level. There is a consensus among EU member states that due to the changes we have been experiencing, the EU must be equipped with a revised global health strategy. Such a strategy must adopt a comprehensive approach in which the European Commission is in close cooperation with other EU institutions and EU member states. At the same time, new partnerships must be forged in the pursuit of global health objectives. In short, a global health strategy which would allow the EU to take a global leadership role in the pursuit of global health goals while holding dear the institutional, institutional values upon which it was built and a global health strategy that recognizes that health depends on more than just health systems. The strong correlation between health and the sociodemographic indices that we all know suggests, strongly suggests that the health sector should consider redefining its scope of concern and so do we do as all. Well. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Minister. And I think, Vesna, that's exactly where uh, you can come in uh, beautifully with some additional comments. You know, which are these other parts of the European Union that need to be much more engaged so that uh, the European Union can really address the determinants of health that are at stake? And of course, uh, Bernhard referred to the many economic and commercial interests also that the European Union has around the world. And continuously, you know, there will be tensions. Just think of uh, the Mercosur negotiations uh, uh, that uh, are being conducted. So, um, uh, you know, how do you think the EU can uh, balance uh, these uh, health needs uh, uh, that are defined from the health perspective and the many other challenges uh, that? Uh, come up and how would that be reflected in a strategy like the minister just said and maybe even new council conclusions unmute thank you very much ilona it's a very complex question so i uh, i don't think i will be able to answer to everything you asked but indeed slovenia has for a long time uh, pushed for uh, an international um, consideration of policies like alcohol policy and so on. Why is that? It is because we realize that there are actually a lot of economic interests behind uh, what we uh, do presently in most of our states, but the problem is the same worldwide. So we should find some solutions and try to, to actually develop certain solutions together. Uh, but if I, um, if I go back to what I was saying um, uh, for our presidency, uh, Slovenia uh, also has realized that uh, working together with other countries, we can develop a lot of innovations that then can be shared. And uh, as we all know, uh, health system are not only challenged by, uh, by COVID uh, or some immediate things, but we are also challenged by, by things that are ongoing and we don't yet have all the solutions such as aging, for example. We are, it's a big challenge. It has become even bigger during the COVID, uh, the problems of uh, elderly and how to actually approach, uh, approach this population during the epidemic they were anyway most affected by it. Uh, and here we see European Union as actually as uh, an uh, integration that could assure uh, investments in developing innovative solutions. And this is actually what we would like 
uh, to be discussed during our presidency, how we could do this better. In this regard, of course, this is also interesting for global cooperation. It's not only about you know, supporting uh, less developed countries financially. It's also about the good practices exchange. It's also about uh, the exchange of professionals maybe that could support countries as it was done in many cases of Slovenia uh, with WHO, for example. Uh, we, for a long time, do not work with WHO in a way of like getting technical support. It's more like working together to get to the appropriate solutions to improve our health system or our policies like mental health policy and so on. So uh, th this could be also done at the global level, you know, that we would share our capacities with those in need. And of course, I could not, uh, not um, do differently than really support what Bernhard has said. Uh, we already now, uh, and now even more than any time, understand how important is global health to health in our own countries and uh, narrow environments where we live. I mean, COVID has proven that, yes, we have to work together, but there are some other things, for example, um, uh, uh, digitalization of health. And here people are mostly focusing on how health could become more digital. And they forget about having a digital patient. You know, our patients has changed a lot. So we have to find different ways of working with them. I think, so, uh, or was it the minister uh, of Portugal that was uh, mentioning, uh, that was mentioning uh, health literacy? This is something that is global, you know, because information is global and how our people understand this information and use it for their benefit is very important. So health is becoming global and we see this initiative, global health, not only as, uh, as something that uh, will make uh, European Union um, be more influential in uh, global area, arena, but also something that is uh, not just necessary, but we, we have to do something because we are all affected by the global processes. Thank you very much for reinforcing that so that, you know, the European Union really becomes a voice of that uh, joint action that is, is necessary. And I might just uh, indicate here, there are some uh, questions that are being raised in, in the uh, chat here that we can't, uh, you know, go to directly, but maybe if in some of your answers you can consider it, you were speaking about the digital dimension, Vesna, and uh, people are asking, you know, how will the European Union as part of this initiative also support the digital transformation and digital health in low and middle income countries. And of course, there is a strong push towards what in the European Union is now called digital sovereignty. What does that mean? Will it you know, close or will it have mechanisms of, of openness? And then of course, an issue that I don't think has been raised yet around the global health workforce and how dependent also uh, Europe is on uh, workforce from other parts of the world, both on the European continent uh, with countries from outside Europe, but of course also much more uh, globally. I'll ask Bernhard to give a, a short comment and then perhaps enter in, into, into some of these, uh, these areas. You know, what are, aside from, you know, the support of WHO, the support of the big uh, COVID universe that is now uh, emerging, uh, what are also specific uh, areas? Uh, because uh, if we look at the European Union, we said, you know, it's the council, it's uh, with the presidencies, it's the commission. We haven't you know, spoken about the parliaments yet, and I understand WHO is working much more also with the interparliamentary union. Mm -hmm. And of course, within that universe, we have these incredibly important agencies, you know, EMA, for example, the European Medicines Agency, the ECDC, the cooperation between WHO and the EU at a more technical level, if I can raise that. 
what are expectations or hopes from WHO there? Because the EU brings expertise, I think, that is important for the WHO and vice versa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilona. And I, I, I really think this is an incredibly inspiring discussion. Um, I, let me just allow to say one word about so the values that, that uh, you raised before and, 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 and among the previous speakers, the, the minister and, and, and state secretary. I think um, what is important, it goes also to your question about the more technical um, aspects, um, that the values um, of the organization of, of the of the commission of the countries of the member states are of course not a different thing from the economic and social and societal thriving I mean it's like uh, that was I think very often a misunderstanding um, that the the you know giving money giving support was seen as uh, a good value, this is the right thing to do. But what we see more and more, and I think this is important to understand this interconnectedness, is that investing in places, in countries, in societies that are, are less, less advantaged in terms of their financial resources actually will also help for the economies at home. It will help for the well-being at home. Uh, so it's really interconnected in ways that we haven't quite understood before. And I think COVID has shown that. So a fair investment is going to pay back uh, for your own economies. Now, uh, you have rightly uh, pointed out that there is incredible capacity, innovation capacity, experience, um, uh, and that is could be technology um, in, the, in the European Union uh, that other countries can benefit. The, the value of actually working together, and you know, I'm of the older generation, like I think many of us who still remember the early days of the European Union, where it was not at all a given that all of these countries would work together and learn together. I think that's a point that also was made previously. I think that's incredibly important. And you know, putting that on a global level more proactively more deliberately on a global level this is also where we do need of course the expertise the experts to work with us we can be the platform we can offer the platform to bring uh, together all countries all experts of course that's that's something we we, we do every day uh, but being proactive in leveraging the expertise uh, from within uh, the European Union and the very excellent experience in part of learning together within Europe, how that can uh, really be applied globally uh, will be very helpful. Now, you mentioned also the parliaments, and I think uh, that's another lesson that we learned. Um, we sometimes in organizations, I say this self-critically, we don't really think enough about the people who fundamentally take the decisions for their people, right? For the, you know, the parliaments are the representation of the people living in these in their countries. And we have to make sure that we include them in our debate, that they fully understand, uh, also understand, you know, how these investments really help and benefit everybody, how they really contribute to making the world a better and safer place for everybody. And I think these are values that people everywhere in the world understand and like. So working much more proactively with, uh, with parliaments has been one of our um, you know, things that we have pushed in the past. And I, as I speak, uh, Dr. Tetos is actually connected with the Health Commission in Germany um, because they have asked uh, for that discussion. Um, that's just one example. And of course, we do this with many, many other places. Uh, but with that, over to you, uh, Ilona, and I'm looking forward to more <laughs> questions, of course, if possible. Thank you. And that has been an interesting development in Germany that there is a subcommittee on global health, a very, very proactive subcommittee who is reaching out to also, you know, visited Geneva, for example, yes. when one could still travel. And uh, this uh, and the big uh, debate that was held in the German parliament on uh, global health and the World Health Organization has been very important because obviously one, as one builds a global health strategy, one needs to be sure that uh, this uh, broad understanding and support is there 
uh, from all levels upward, particularly uh, as part of multilateralism. That's why I'd like to, uh, to ask uh, the minister, um, what are obstacles to this strategy? We're sort of talking as if everyone wants this, uh, let's move ahead. Uh, do you see any obstacles? What could make it difficult? What should such a strategy take into account? Okay. Uh, I, I would say that uh, uh, we can uh, identify two main obstacles. Uh, we need to, to have a, a common uh, perspective of uh, uh, the way we want to move forward. Uh, I think that it is very important to, to learn from COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, uh, once the, the pandemic crisis is over, uh, the WHO, for instance, cannot see a reduction in its ability to act. Uh, we cannot control future types of viruses or new types of diseases from arising. However, uh, there is room at the global level for all of us to be better prepared than we, we were when the pandemic first hit. Um, COVID-19 put the, the globe, uh, the world through test. Uh, now it's time to move forward uh, towards a substantial reform of the WHO. And financial aspects matter, and uh, political commitment matters. Uh, it is time for the WHO to empower itself and uh, to become uh, an organization that meets the needs of a globalized world, but this depends on all countries. Um, the EU and uh, its member states can, can and must play an active role in the context of uh, uh, this uh, reform, of this uh, uh, deeper and broader role of WHO. Uh, namely through uh, advocating for the, the defense of uh, health as a human right, uh, supporting global solidarity and uh, establishing a model of ruling the WHO uh, that is based on multilateralism. So uh, I would say that uh, two uh, main hostels remain uh, in the room uh, financial and political, uh, and they are much more related than uh, one ever would think. Thank you very much. And you know, there is this debate about how political is health, and we are actually recognizing how political health is, and that our challenge is not to make health non political, but how to manage the politics of health. And there, I think there's quite a, a discussion also on, you know, how that should happen and be balanced also within the World Health Organization and, you know, its various governing bodies, etc., and the way it acts in an emergency and the way it acts normally. So I would ask State Secretary Weiss to perhaps uh, share with us uh, some of the ideas that have been brought uh, by a group of countries into the discussion at WHO, at the executive board. Uh, it's, you know, there's a document that's called the German French reform paper uh, that's been circling in uh, global health uh, uh, groups. Uh, so uh, could you explain a little bit to us what this, as we call it in diplomatic terms, non-paper, uh, what that actually implies. We lost you. We can't hear you. Ah, yes. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Thank no you. Problem. I, I tried. In, in August, the non-paper has been presented to the WHO in Geneva. It identifies key challenges for the WHO and recommends 
10 concrete actions to defend, build upon and further strengthen the organization's leading and coordinating role in global health governments. The paper has received great support by many member states, the WHO, but also the wider global health community. In addition, the paper inspired the discussions we have had with the EU member states in the Council in the process to agree on Council conclusions on this issue. The non-paper does not aim to preempt the review process that the World Health Assembly's COVID-19 resolution has called for. Rather, it is put forward in order to provide specific input to the different review and reform processes on the way. Our main aim is we have to learn from this pandemic to make the world safer for the future, for this strengthening WHO is key. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Vesna, you're involved, you know, also at both levels of uh, the WHO very much uh, and uh, reform processes, transitions of the organization, etc., are sort of commonplace happening all the time. Uh, how would you uh, see that uh, uh, from, uh, from your perspective? Where are key reform issues for WHO that uh, the European Union should be taking forward in dialogue with WHO? Um, well, um, WHO uh, in the European part of WHO, I think has been for quite some time working hand in hand with EU. But maybe we should improve this cooperation a little bit in the future. And uh, I was glad that somebody, uh, and it was a minister of Portugal, mentioned the, the issues that are uh, around its political will and its financing. But there are always solutions, uh, although they need a kind of strategic rethinking. Uh, and here I'm very glad to hear that we are all supportive to, to some common strategy for global health, which of course includes also EU cooperation with WHO. Uh, but um, um, I would go back and remind us that when we were discussing health systems in Tallinn, we all agreed that now is time to implement implement and innovate. These were the two E's that I uh, uh, that sounds in my, my head. And for uh, doing so, we need to be uh, a little bit more practical. It's I think everything has to start with uh, non-papers and strategic approaches, but then you need the real action plans and you really need to go for the implementation. And when you ask me how could we do it better, EU and WHO, I think that EU should actually try to, uh, to uh, not, just, uh, not just approach uh, WHO in a strategic way, not just by financing, but we should actually uh, try to work together to develop certain solutions because there's a lot of uh, expertise in WHO. Not only that, be, uh, uh, it, there is a lot of expertise, but there is also a lot of knowledge how to work with other countries. They have access to, to their governments and so on. So they are a very good um, um, opener of the doors of certain countries because they are there, they work with them, they help them. So, I mean, we could come uh, as an EU supporting them with good practice and financially through uh, uh, WHO opening doors for us in those countries. And this is, we have an example, Southeastern European Network, for example, where it was um, a lot of work done together and WHO was always there to support this initiative. So um, we had various topics that were discussed and the, the experience and good practices were shared, but uh, uh, everything was done also with the expertise and knowledge and evidence that, that came from WHO. So in different fields like mental health, um, uh, nutrition, whatever, there were different topics in this Southeastern 
environment. Uh, and I think this kind of cooperation uh, should be a solution when we come to implementation. So it's good that we have some strate strategy. Uh, we are very supportive to this. It's great if the, we then go a little bit deeper and have some action plan. This, uh, when you are a preparing action plan, of course, it's very important, uh, the financing uh, and the political will also. But if you get through, then you have actually to implement it in the country. So I'm speaking now globally. Uh, uh, you know, and there I come back to what I said before that here Europe is strong, European Union is strong, we have a lot of expertise, we have a lot of institutions that are, for example, um, uh, dealing with also with communicable diseases now that can actually, you mentioned ECDC, but there is Koch Institute and others in the countries, you know, that can actually uh, bring some knowledge into the global world and then we succeed with what was said before that you know we make the whole world healthier and this will impact also on us in european union thank you very much uh, for that person i'll pass on to bernard to say you know what could really be concrete elements of that at country level i know how committed you are uh, to the country level uh, but I'd like to add another dimension to that, if I may, because the colleagues here have also been speaking a lot about how Europe can support, what Europe can bring. But maybe from your perspective, you know, particularly if we're looking at the COVID situation now, um, what can the others bring to Europe? What is innovation elsewhere that Europe can benefit from? And I think in COVID we have seen uh, where Europe perhaps was a little arrogant at some points in time, we know what to do. And actually others were doing it much better. So what chances are there for that kind of learning system and a learning system, you know, at eye level, if I can call it that, that would be so important. Bernhard, please. Thank you, Lona. I think uh, this is really an excellent and very, very important point. What can we learn from each other? and at the end of the day, um, I think I mentioned this initially, it is really how we in the world, all over the world, can actually work better together and learn from each other and act together. And I will come to back, that, back to that in a minute. Um, I think the one thing where um, uh, we can really learn also, if I may say so, from the Global South, so it's, you know, and that's what, what COVID has shown, you just mentioned it. It was the first time that the world was taken by a massive shock that was not a problem of the South. It was a problem of everywhere. And some of the richest countries with the best system had the worst problems. It really taught us a lesson. We were not prepared, despite all the resources that we have, despite all the great systems we have. And one of the, there's two probably really important elements here. There's many that, that we could discuss, but there's two important elements. One is decisive uh, political leadership. And uh, I would actually like to take a moment to hold up this new publication, which is uh, Health is a Political Choice, is a second edition, which I think many, in many ways actually talks about that. Um, and it's just uh, launched for the World Health Assembly, uh, no, for the World Health Summit, apologies. <laughs> uh, uh, so please, please look it up. And it has many statements which are really, really, really important and helpful. The second point I want to make is, and I think it goes more to the core, uh, um, Ilona, to, of your question, um, is that we have seen how communities have actually picked up uh, in the response, how communities, and it has nothing to do with the level of money. It is actually how uh, local leadership has reached out to communities, to women's, I think it has, has been mentioned many times in this discussion as well, to women's groups, to local leaders, to engage them in the response so that they can understand they can uh, move forward together, they can take the difficult decisions together. And that's something we see in Europe today. How can we sustain the understanding of what COVID does and how we have to behave together uh, to actually stay safe together? That's really a very important lesson. And it's not only for COVID, it, we have seen the same thing in HIV and AIDS. We have seen this in many other areas. We will see this as we look into aging, as we look into NCDs, as we look into One Health, where difficult decisions will have to be taken, decisions that relate to economic situations, that relate to money that we have to spend. But ultimately, if people understand 
why this is important, they're much more likely to act. And I think that's one of the lessons where we can, from the rich north, learn a lot from the much less rich south. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I think you know this uh, notion of, uh, of learning and learning together and using the WHO as a platform and entry point is a very, very important one. I've promised everyone that we will end very punctually because all of you have lots of responsibilities uh, and uh, we want to honor that. So uh, I think I'd like to end with a little bit of an outlook and ask each of you to say a few words. Uh, I'll start with uh, State Secretary Weiss, uh, uh, since uh, you hold the presidency. Uh, what would you hope is uh, the outcome of the upcoming ministers' conference? What would the roadmap and the milestones be in this context so that our viewers get an understanding of the next steps? Please. At the conference of the health ministers on October 2 in this year, the majority of all member states agreed that the EU should take on a leading proactive and coordinating role in shaping the WHO reform with the aim to strengthen the organ organization. Based on this exchange, Council conclusions have been drafted, focusing on the strengthening of the WHO and the EU's leading role therein. These Council conclusions are tabled for political agreement in a special EBSCO on this Friday. We, we very much hope for an adoption, which, uh, which would be an extraordinary political signal towards a common position of the EU with regards to the strengthening of the WHO. And now, Mrs. Kikbush and all members, sorry, I, I have to leave now. I wish you all the best and thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, for giving us uh, this outlook and this direction, particularly for next Friday. Oh, yes, next Friday. And uh, please, again, you know, pass on our good wishes uh, to the minister, and we hope to be able to discuss with him soon on uh, one of the future occasions. Uh, Vesna, if uh, you look at that, the conference of uh, the ministers, the council conclusions, uh, what do you hope uh, will uh, give you guidance and uh, indications also for your presidency? Well, um, of course, uh, it is a process, so we hope that we will very soon know what is our role in this process. Uh, uh, we have to actually see where, uh, how far we will come with the strategy, if, and uh, of course we will make sure that we will, with all our strength, support the process to end with uh, something uh, really strategic and uh, um, offering some uh, space uh, for uh, European Union to act globally better than we did before. Thank you, Vesna. Minister Timido, what uh, are your expectations and, you know, with what bang are you going to take over on the 1st of January? Yes. Thank you. I think that uh, our uh, great concern right now is implementation, as Vesna previously said. Uh, we have a common share of uh, consensus um, about moving forward, so we need to do it right now. Um, with the concern of leaving no one behind and with concern of uh, having the good solutions for uh, improving global health, uh, both for our countries and for the countries uh, that uh, have relations with us as uh, for Portugal are the CPLP countries. This is the greatest concern right now, 
moving forward implementation, uh, practical solutions, solutions that uh, uh, people feel in their daily lives. Uh, otherwise, uh, we, we face a, a, a great challenge of uh, uh, failing. Yes, thank you very much for that. And that, of course, is also very much uh, one of the themes around a European health union. You know, where else but through health can people feel the impact of a European health union, both, uh, you know, within the union, the neighboring countries and, uh, and the world. It's that making things tangible that uh, uh, the European Union can make a difference uh, for people uh, that will be absolutely critical. Just a short final question to you, Bernhard, before we close and really very, very short. Does this open up also perhaps negotiations for a new kind of relationship between the European Union and the WHO? There's a letter of understanding, you know, there's these kinds of things. Do you think it's time to think about that as well? Yes, thank, thank you, uh, Ilona, and, and thank you all the, the other panelists for their incredible statements. Yes, I agree. Um, I think we, we have learned over the past months more than ever before. I mean, the EU was always an incredibly important partner, but how uh, we together have been able uh, to really change systems, change approaches, build trust, and that might be the one most important thing in working together. Um, that's the only way that we can take difficult decisions forward together. So I think we would be very happy to engage with uh, you know, the presidency, but all the other, you know, member states of the European Union uh, to work on more formal understanding how we can do this and how we can be remind each other of not letting go um, of pushing our common agenda, the values, everything has been said today. Uh, we would be very much looking forward to engage uh, in on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, our panel members without planning it this way. We had a very strong female panel. Fantastic. Uh, so uh, uh, I'd like to say how pleased I am of you know, the issues that were raised. I'm not going to repeat all of them. But I do think what came out towards the end now, the importance of implementation uh, that, you know, words and strategies and everything are necessary, but then, you know, one really needs to turn them into action. Uh, the bringing the European people with uh, this strategy, making understandable how important it is to be a global actor and to support global health initiatives and the WHO. And of course, within the European Union to strengthen the trust that is necessary uh, to also take uh, many of the issues that uh, we have raised forward. And we've had, you know, new uh, political science research that actually shows what a difference trust, trust in the government, trust in the political processes has made uh, in uh, fighting COVID. And, uh, there is, you know, one issue around multilateralism, democracies and trust and values that is very, very critical and that the EU will have to look at within the European Union and uh, in terms of its global role with other partners. So it's exactly 12.30. I would like to thank you very much, uh, Minister Temido. Dear Vesna Petric, thank you very much. Thank you, Bernhard, and uh, thanks for a great discussion. We had a lot of audience, and I hope uh, they were able to gain something from it. Bye-bye. Thank you.